Hello, everyone. I'm going to be speaking in English. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, welcome back to the conference and to our session on alter neoliberalism, about which I will say something in a minute. But there is actually an error in the um, program in terms of the order of, order of speakers and who's actually in the session. The abstracts are correct, but on this single sheet, it actually has the wrong name. Christina is our second speaker. I hope she can hear us over there in California. Hi, Christina. So she's our second speaker. Our first is Dimitrios. Um, before we start, I'm not going to do long introductions either because we only have an hour and I will make sure we finish in an hour from now. I just wanted to start off by a, a short introduction, saying that from the sessions this morning, we're already developing what is a complex discussion around many things, um, including and beyond using this term neoliberal. Um, I quite like to get some people talking about what the term means, because I think we're slightly missing that. We're assuming it. Um, one of the things that I wanted to suggest was that we're dealing with a, in this session particularly, a kind of historiographical and conceptual rethink of a problematic. And those of us who were around in the uh, late 70s and the early 80s and working in universities, as I was, will remember that the term that dominated in those days was in fact late capitalism. Um, I don't remember neoliberalism as a term being used until the 90s, actually. And I went through my degree, PhD, and working in universities in the 80s, and struggled to remember that term being used. So what I hope, one of the things that will come out of this discussion will be um, a reconsideration of the relationship between this term neoliberal, neoliberalism, neoliberalization, um, Remembering something that David Harvey said a long time ago, neoliberalism was neither new nor liberal. Um, so I think that's worth bearing in mind. But its relationship to late capitalism as a concept and an idea, problematic. Um, globalization that we've had already. Um, the post-colonial stroke decolonial, which I think has become much more pressing as a kind of distinction in the last few years, particularly. Um, and its relationship to Cold War, actually, and Neo-Cold War. Um, so it's that matrix of terms and their interrelationship that really interests me, um, hopefully in terms of what we might get from this session and following sessions. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dimitris Soudias from the London School of Economics, who is talking on theorizing an alter neoliberal critique. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think you can hear me all right. I'll try to speak slow. Um, thanks, first of all, for having me. Um, from the slides. OK, you can tell that um, the title is slightly changed, and this is really representing um, my changes in the paper, which I'm currently working on, it's now entitled Alter Neoliberal Analysis, Abduction, Critique, and Alter Politics. And really the idea of alter neoliberalism is something that struck me since um, my doctoral work, where I tried to look at the formation of political subjectivity in the grace of crisis and austerity, and where my interlocutors in, in trying to sort of overcome neo uh, neoliberal rationalities they also unwittingly reproduce them in this race paradox of emancipation that I like uh, increasingly grew interested in. Now, um, these are all sort of screenshots from within the last year, some of them as like a couple of weeks ago only, which is that yet again, neoliberalism has been proclaimed dead, which uh, this time has to do with COVID-19 and the sort of state emergency measures which raises questions about the ways in which we understand, study, and therefore critique alter neoliberalism and the prospects of eventually overcoming it. Now, works um, by Dieter Pleve, Quinslow Bodian, Colin Crouch, the or Jamie Pack that talk about zombie neoliberalism, the nine lives of neoliberalism, or the strange non-death of it, sort of already point at this. And really what they do is they think through neoliberalism, in parts at least, as a political epistemological program, a, a cultural formation 
that is so successful pre precisely because it encroaches upon competing worldviews. So in this sense, um, I am providing a little bit of a definition for neoliberalism. I hope that satisfies our moderator. Um, <laughs> the way I go about this is I look at it as a political epistemological program rather than mere free market fundamentalism. So that is, and here I draw from Bill Davies, the effort to treat everything as if it is a market in a classically Bentamite sense. And I'm thinking here also through, you know, the pain and pleasure of uh, classically yeah, Bentamite utilitarianisms and his happiness maxime, and then again the critique of happiness and well-being, as we will see a little bit later on, that really reduces qualitative judgment to quantitative evaluation and invents its own methodological devices and ways of knowing. So this, in consequence, as I'm sure we know, transforms the ways in which we think through culture, the social, the political, and so on and so forth, and increasingly reduces it to metrics or quasi-metrics and sort of social indicators and other forms of ag aggregates. Um, but this does not necessarily mean it's merely cold-hearted Benthamism, right? Um, as pragmatic sociology has told us, neoliberalism has managed to co-opt such seemingly uncapturable phenomena as affectivity or radical movements of emancipation, ideas of autonomy, creativity, self-realization, self-governance, and really self-responsibility also if we think about sort of the ways in which this critique first emanated at the workplace. These are just some pop cultural reference points I think we can all make sense of. Um, the ways in which journalistic writing occurs has changed. Increasingly, we're ranking, you know, uh, the ways in which we write. Top 10, I think, is an interesting sort of um, way in which this happens. Positivity and happiness, where, you know, structural critiques reduced to self-critique, unhappiness being pathologized, and really happiness um, is being captured. These are the recent Eurostat indicators by the European Commission that sort of try to, you know, transition from perhaps the, 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 brut, uh, the gross domestic uh, product to more well-being indicators. This is one in Greece. Self-perceived health as an indicator, you know, that um, authorities draw from in order to, I guess, produce realities rather than represent them. And then also, you know, design thinking and creativity, the entrepreneurial ethos, self-tracking and the self-quantification. And what is interesting here is, and I think Mark Fisher would have said that this is neoliberalism has become commonsensical. It's it's become opaque. So it's not merely um, free market fundamentalism, but so much more. And it has its inbuilt modes of critique. Self optimization is really, you know, a mode of sort of translating the self into data, and then in a constant pursuit of of betterment. And ranking is the same thing. So there is sort of an inbuilt mode of critique. And I think when we critique neoliberalism, it's important to keep that in mind. Now, against this backdrop, the question that arises is what is to be done? How can we study and critique neoliberal rationalities in a way that furthers rather than undermines and recuperates emancipatory processes of transformation? I know this is not a new question. I'm just asking it again, coming from pra pragmatic sociology, really, and a little bit of abductive uh, theorizing. And this is really the ambition to outline such a, such a mode of thinking, if you will. So in the end, um, this is really just translating or reframing, reconfiguring the literatures that are already there, as particularly the ones that pertain to political epistemological you know, ways in which uh, neoliberalism is being studied. And I'd like to suggest three abductive movements that are linked to each other and structured by abduction as a, mo as a mode of inference, and I'll talk a little bit about this later. But abduction also links these three movements. And I'd like to just label them as follows, the first one is to make visible the opaque ways in which neoliberal rationalities encroach upon practice. The second one, on this basis, then we can critique them in a way that minimizes their reproduction and on this basis, radically imagine conceivable political epistemological alternatives. So here we need to also draw, of course, from neoliberal ways of knowing and thinking and measuring. So beyond, you know, merely neoliberal policies or critiques of them. On abduction, I think some or many of you may know what this is, and um, some of you don't. Really, abduction is the mode sort of inquiry and thinking through these things. It's um, an, an American pragmatist transition and epistemologically anti-essentialist. 
And he tries to reconcile the artificial separation in positivist thinking between context of discovery and context of justification, and therefore tries to, you know, make induction, deduction, abduction as part and parcel of the same research process. If we follow pragmatists such as Pierce and Dewey, we know that abduction arises when ordinary habits of action and experiences are disrupted by unanticipated events or observations. So this may look like a hat or, or a dented pen upside down. If we already know what it is, you know, because we know of, of the work where this is represented, then this would be induction, by the way. Abduction is when we produce speculative hunches um, by coming to the conclusion that this is, you know, an elephant um, trapped in a snake, as we know from The Little Prince by Sonic Superby. Now, how do we do this? Um, so this is, of course, sort of notoriously difficult, and I guess there is no sort of process in which we can really train this. But really, it's a thing to think through manipulating habits of thought and conduct. And in alter neoliberal analysis, I would suggest um, sort of reframing abduction as the deliberative, the deliberate imaginative construction of crises. We break the fit with our normative expectations and our subjective exp um, experiences. Sorry. And this prompts a process of inquiry that seeks to requalify ordinary experience with the ensuing perceived need or desire to change the practice that led to that experience. And on this basis, we can then critique and reflect and theorize from previously unquestioned assumptions. Now, I will just you know, go through the three movements and then and with some conclusions. The first one is visibilization, which I think you know, we can really draw from criti Bourdieu's in critical sociology, which is to first ask how we can make visible the opaque ways in which neoliberal rationalities creep into thunder conduct. And this is to raise toxic assumptions to the level of discourse where they, where they become visible and where, they become, where they, we can cr critique them. I think it is important in pragmatist thought that really we can understand what neoliberalism is by studying how it is practiced and then, you know, imagine conceivable uh, consequence. This is part of the tenets of pragmatist thought. The problem, of course, that arises with assuming what the doxic or the normative is, is the ontological basis of this. So what is the normative base upon which we can justify the validity of claiming something is or isn't doxic um, or normative, you know, in that sense, or commonsensical? And I think a way out is provided by abduction and pragmatic sociology, which is to visibilize the factual orderings of neoliberal rationalities, that is, that they are constructed rather than natural, and on this basis visibilize the normative nature of these orderings, that is, that they are value-laden rather than neutral. I think rankings are again an example, the idea of competition obviously is not human but constructed, and that this of course produces concrete realities, and in Foucaultian terms really the idea of statistics as producing realities rather than representing them. Now, on this basis, we can conduct critique, I would suggest, but I would like to start with a caveat, which is, again, you know, based on um, pragmatic sociology. And this is that the success of neoliberalism is really that it achieved to appropriate the subversive forces that sought to undermine the legitimacy of capitalism for its own purposes. When we challenge or resist it, sometimes we unwittingly reproduce it. Think of social innovation, social impact um, as such modes, you know, through which we try to better the world. So really it's important to keep in mind that at times, so that we un, you know, by sheer virtue that we always critique from a position of within, as we have just, you know, mentioned in the earlier panel, we'll always reproduce some of these tenets. The question that sort of derives from this is how can we distinguish between emancipatory processes of transformation and imminent critiques that reproduce and foster neoliberalism? So first, I'd like to think through critique as anti-politics, and this is a concept by Rassan Haas, who's a, an anthropologist um, based in Melbourne, I think. And he's, this is not to say that you know, a critique is apolitical, but rather that it is always positioned against sort of the politics of power, of domination, in this case, and neoliberalism. And Boltanski then tells us this is why critique is predominantly a moral activity. And on this basis, we then can critique the factual orderings of neoliberalism and the normative character of these orderings, as I've just tried to show. Now, these are just some thoughts, you know, that um, we can think through when we talk about minimizing critique. I think a critique of neoliberalism can never be grounded in positivist thought. I think that's a big sort of, you know, and quantification measurement. The valuation processes of economization, capitalization, assetization, and other, you know, recent trends in the cultural economy literatures 
clearly utilitarianism and such, you know, ethos as managerialism and entrepreneurialism. I'm saying this because one of my interlocutors in um, Athens, when she told me how she organizes her work in the solidarity sort of organization, is the first thing I do is a SWOT analysis, which is like strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. So she draws from business strategy in order to organize, you know, emancipation, if you will. So this is just, you know, an example, and I'm sure there's many more. Against creativity, um, I'm, I'm sure that this might be contested, but of course I'm talking here about Olli Molt's work of the neoliberalization of creativity that again really just produces more of the same. Behavioralism, happiness and positivity, it's really the behavioral psycholo psychologization that sort of reduces the self as a force where change comes from within rather than from relations between us, you know, with a clear Cartesian split of sort of the rational mind that masters the rational body. Um, and it's really about, if you will, recuperating this trend in neoliberalism, the economization of social, cultural, and so on life, where critique is replaced with technique and where, uh, where qualitative judgment is substituted with quantitative measurement or quantitative modes or quasi-quantitative modes of evaluation. Now, perhaps on this basis then, you know, knowing about what we, how we can make these practices visible and um, how we need to sort of minimize the reproduction, we can think through alter politics. How can we radically imagine an alter politics that is grounded in an epistemological base that is incommensurable and incomprehensible to neoliberal modes of thinking and knowing? I think that works on the radical imagination from uh, Castoriadis to Haven Kasnab is sort of a good starting point. And this is based also on the assumption that imagination stems from experience <clears throat> and or the fact that our experience of the world are differently. They're differently intersectionally positioned, you know, along sexuality, race, gender, class, ethnicity, and others. So the radical imagination emerges from this variation, from disagreements and conflicts, and it requires us to at least in part negate experience, or at the very least negate the necessity of experience, and suggest as possible that which feels at some level as inconceivable. Now what may this pertain? <clears throat> What can neoliberalism not understand is really, you know, a way in which we can go about this. And I think there's stuff already there. Think of, you know, the, the movement of the squares of, you know, 2010-11 onward, an egalitarian and anti-authoritarian ethic that is based on forms of collectivity, trust and love that is solidarity-based rather than transactional, you know. Prefiguration is a mode of practice is, I think, uh, something that neoliberalism perhaps can't understand because entrepreneurial sort of thought is grounded in means and system. Um, prefiguration is a mode of, you know, already entailing the very values of the society you seek to build may be difficult for neoliberal practice to comprehend. Deleuze and Guattari's idea of the non-denumerable, which is that which cannot be quantified relations, connections, flows, and becomings, you know, this, the liminal spaces between that that neoliberalism perhaps proclaims as data sets and data points, that it can merely correlate, may also be a way out to think through, you know, what can perhaps be the alter political qualities. And um, Peter Fleming's work on silence, you know, I mean, both liberal and radical thought sort of assume that the idea of voice and expression is a means often to power. What if we were to refuse the idea of this productive activity sort of or because I think it, I, there is an underlying productive activity in expression. Harney and Moten's work on the undercommons similarly, you know, talks about refusal, disloyalty, uncollegiality at the workplace, unprofessionality, you know, sort of borderline neg negligence perhaps are also ways to think through alternatives. And um, of course, there's limits. You know, and I'd like to just close with them. And it's really the paradox that I think at least occurred at this pace to sort of argue proactively for such modes as, as silence, which is a, a paradox. And I think analogous to Spivak's ideas of affirmative sabotage, which is really trying to you know, transgress um, modes of um, domination for yeah, their own transgression or manipulate them, an alter neoliberal analysis is sympathetic to and learns from struggles that assume that instruments of domination can be manipulated to become techniques for their transgression. And while 
we ought to recognize the cogency of transgression as both an analytical heuristic and a compelling object of analysis, the transformative qualities of ultra-neoliberal analysis requires to not concede to the idea of transgression, to not believe in it. And I'd like to just, you know, leave this paradox as it stands and maybe turn to sort of Kierkegaard with what I think could be the disposition of ultra-neoliberal analysis to its own limitations, which is to say that, you know, to try to want to discover something that thought itself cannot think, but sort of, you know, tweaking towards thought cannot uh, cannot think itself or cannot think yet. And I'd like to close, close with this. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitris. Um, there will be time for questions um, after our next speaker. Who is Christina Novakov Ritchie sorry, from the University of California, who will be speaking on post-socialist performance as insurgent method? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes, great. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers for producing this event. I really wish that I could be there in person with you all, but next time. So today I am presenting post-socialist performance as insurgent methodology. And we'll start with a little introduction from Harney and Moten Dingley after uh, Demetrius's reference itself. Um, the quote that I want to start with is the object of abolition then would have a resemblance to communism that would be to return to Spivak uncanny. The uncanny that disturbs the critical going on above it, the professional going on without it, the uncanny that one can sense in prophecy, the strangely known moment, the gathering content of a cadence, and the uncanny that one can sense in cooperation, the secret once called solidarity. The uncanny feeling we are left with is that something else is there in the undercommons. It is the prophetic organization that works for the red and black abolition. The project of post-socialist performance as an insurgent methodology concerns the pliability of historical consciousness in the realms of both education and artistic production. Beginning with the fundamental dual temporality of post-socialism as a post, meaning both an ending and a continuation, post-socialism like other posts is largely concerned with how we conceptualize our relationship to the past. However, unlike post-colonialism and post-modernism, Post-socialism appears to foreclose continuity much more definitely. Socialism is over, so now what's next? Of course, there are whispers that remain of socialism in the cases of Cuba, China, and North Korea, but these invocations are quickly followed by a litany of reasons why they are not examples of quote unquote real socialism. Within this discursive frame, socialism is presented as an anachronism, which should have died along with the Cold War. The examples of socialism that remain are written off as ruins of that war and we are invited to forget about them. An insurgent post-socialist methodology refuses this process of forgetting and insists upon the ongoing relevance of socialist experience and the significance of socialist practice for the present moment. An insurgent post-socialist methodology reimagines the entire world as post-socialist, a world which extends from Angola to Venezuela to Uzbekistan. After all, it was not the Berlin Wall which kicked off the toppling dominoes of state socialism, but rather first Chile in 1973, followed by Sudan in 1985, and Burma in 1988. This post-socialist world lays bare the intimate relationship of post-colonialism and anti-colonialism to post-socialism and of decolonization to communism. The post-Cold War reclassification of the world from three worlds into two has left the history of communist decolonial solidarity as collateral damage. This is distressing not only because rich theoretical contributions were generated at this intersection 
but also because it makes revolution seem abstract. It is extremely difficult to imagine a total transformation of society, whether that be whether that revolution be anti-colonial or socialist, if one has no historical examples to draw upon. Tiasha Kanzler has described post-socialist amnesia as a process of violence, writing that, quote, the post of post-socialism, rather than celebrating the embracement of democracy and free market capitalism, speaks about further processes of colonization, which allow the former West to fulfill itself by deforming what is being suppressed, the materiality of our history, knowledge, and memory. The reconfiguration of former socialist states through the deregulation of economy, the privatization of public institutions, and its integration into the global market in an abstract way erased the whole space, its anti-fascist, anti-colonial, and feminist history practices and theoretical reflections. Revolutionary momentum depends upon the remembering of histories of struggle. The task of insurgent post-socialist methodology is to resuscitate those material histories, knowledges, practices, and memories of anti-fascism, anti-colonialism, and feminism, amongst other things, and to disturb any narratives of post-socialist transition as a neutral process. Section two, the revolution is boring. In the context of the American university system where I work, unsurprisingly, discussion of communism and socialism is frowned upon, unless spoken about with disdain. The US Academy has still not had its reckoning for its cooperation with COINTELPRO and its participation in McCarthyism, which has left American Cold War mythology largely undisturbed. Besides presenting an extreme conflict of interest for those studying post-socialism, this normative disdain is also quite boring in the sense that when socialism or Eastern Europe become the object of discussion, we are generally forced to listen to a banal recitation of Cold War mythology at length. Everything is still retro, everything is gray, made of cement, the people are oppressed, they don't get to drink Coca-Cola, etc. After the rehearsal of these narratives for the greater part of the last century, they have ended up becoming quite dull. And this affect of boredom seems to actually coat everything to do with socialism and Eastern Europe in the US classroom, including art. On the surface, perhaps only to me, it is surprising that something like socialist realism could be considered so boring as students are usually easily excited by contemporary aesthetic projects that lay claim to radical political ideologies. Provocatively broad in their claims, Boyana Kunst and Boris Groys have taken up this issue when they've theorized that the primary distinction between capitalist and socialist aesthetics can be boiled down to the opposition of art as a skeptical critique of representation versus art as a critical affirmation of socialist ideology. When the capitalist argues, the performance event is immediately suspicious of the authority of the artist. In the socialist East, she argues that there is faith in the performer's political ideology, that the performer's political ideology translates into the immediate material reality. Kunst identifies this authentic gesture as the moment of alienation experienced by socialist artists, Western audiences which ultimately translates into the affect of boredom. Performances in actually existing socialism sought to, speak a, sought to speak to a world beyond the world of art, while in Western Europe and the Anglosphere, the political questions of the artwork most often center around the work of art itself. This reuptake of art for art's sake ideology underpinning capitalist artistic production causes the Western spectator to consider the socialist artist as naive, banal, and already seen. The reaction of boredom or the presumption of kitsch provides affective data on the perceived relationship of politics to art. In the US, for example, art often employs political aesthetics, but often, or I should say generally, does not do political work beyond the politics of representation. 
this depoliticization of art had less to do with the artists themselves and much more to do with the imperial state apparatus to be bored by the premise that one has ideological faith in the capacity of a state to recognize the politics of art is an immobilizing pessimism promoted from above and a pacifying pessimism. To be postmodern then is to be cynical of the possibility for art to produce politics. Refusing this cynicism, Gita Kapoor defends the political utility of the term avant-garde which provides a useful model through which to understand the work being done by post-socialist artists. For Kapoor, taking up the avant-garde in the present is not a nostalgic act, but rather a strategic refusal of neoliberalism's reclamation of art for art's sake and a regrounding of difference. Specifically grounding the avant-garde in its imbrication in the global histories of socialism and anti-colonialism Kapoor argues that the avant-garde provides a template for radical situational politics, which are grounded in the specific needs and histories of a location while also being able to speak to interconnections across time and space. She writes that while the history of the avant-garde gives us a template for radical disruptions, it is important to keep alive questions of material practice. It follows that situational politics, the very site for avant-garde initiatives, should be rescued from subsumption in the global imaginary. There is need to focus on location, as an archaeologist would, and simultaneously shift paradigms, as a philosopher would. A concept like heterotopia speaks of other spaces, spaces with several places of difference, real and metaphoric otherness, and rerouted allusions to utopias. Post-socialist possibility invokes the avant-garde. While the area studies foreclosing of post-socialism as a euphemism for Eastern Europe fails to understand the global scale of the transformation of the 80s and 90s, there is something valuable in never being able to leave the regional behind. Difference is already foregrounded in a way that is intolerable to universalist myth-making. As a student of post-socialism, you are tasked with navigating between local histories and theories of the totality for the sake of making connections to other places and other times. Wary of the homogenizing and flattening machinations of neoliberalism, I offer the messy umbrella of post-socialism as method, as a sort of Benjaminian return to the present and a process of producing new modes of historical consciousness. Now, I'd like to share a few key examples of works of post-socialist video and performance that embody what I define as this insurgent post-socialist methodology as they peel back the epidermis that holds historical consciousness together. So the artwork Queer in Space, Kolontai Commune Archive, for example, is a speculative documentary work by Schwab, the School of Theory and Activism in Bishkek, in which the artists weave together a group of salvaged archival materials from the 1970s and 80s that demonstrate the radical visions of queer socialist subjects. Running counter to the narrative that the collapse of state socialism liberated queer communities, socialist thought is centered in this queer speculative archive. The group members pick up various documents critiquing the late Soviet model of the heterosexual nuclear family. However, they do not make this critique by appealing to liberal feminism, but rather by drawing upon the work of socialist feminist Alexandra Kolontai, whose portrait has been pasted on the wall of Marx and Engels. Uh, Kolontai's radical critique of the family as a site of exploitation is stretched by Staub in order to critique gender normativity and heterosexuality altogether as instruments of exploitation. Staub's mobilization of the socialist past to imagine a queer communist future is echoed in Hongwei Bao's work on queer comrades in post-socialist China. In his article on the semantic transformation of the word Tongji from comrade to queer, Bao writes that, quote, while many researchers have correctly identified the role of neoliberal capitalism in constructing desiring subjects in contemporary China, 
they have often neglected or undermined the impact of China's socialist past on today's subject formation and politics. Queer identities and activism in contemporary China demonstrate that the socialist comrade has become a foundation of, and even a catalyst for, the post-socialist gay subject. The Soviet past serves as a very different type of catalyst in the work of Afghan artist Lida Abdul. Abdul's video work in transit follows Afghan children as they reanimate a ruined Soviet warplane. In the opening of the video, we read the artist's text, quote, anything is possible when everything is lost, end quote. The interplay of anything and everything in Abdul's video invokes the peculiar temporality of both the post-war and the post-socialist subjects loss of the future. In losing the future or everything, Abdul invokes anything as not a total departure from the known, but as a reconfiguration of history. The hopeful connotation of anything is possible invites the viewer to construct a new future, a new utopic destination without which the procession of life is unbearable, but which still remains unknown to us. Li Ron's video work from truck driver to the political commissar of the mounted troops takes inspiration from the Soviet film, The Fate of Man. In the video, Li Ron plays the role of a Soviet soldier imitating the Soviet style of acting as he reminisces on the past and yearns for the future. Following the wide scale collapse of most socialist states and the accompanying decline in standard of living in those countries, it has become increasingly difficult to imagine a future beyond environmental destruction, poverty, and scarcity. Both socialist artists such as Stab, Abdul, and Liran push back against this foreclosure of the future. By reviving the historical imagination of the future from socialism, these artists invite the public to once again think the future. Section four, which is communists and adjuncts. To believe within the walls of the university is unprofessional. To believe is to stand too close to the object of study to let oneself be overcome by ideas, experiences, and other people. Scholars are told to teach about rituals, about ideologies, but not to practice them. As a learner and a teacher, our subjectivities should be presumed blank so that we may engage our objects of study with critical distance and objectivity. Each object of study is situated as an object among objects. Their relation to one another is abstracted, which ultimately enables content to be extracted by the knower. To betray these fundamental rules results in one being seen as unserious, unprofessional, too sincere, and too biased. In their influential text, The Undercommons, Fugitive Planning and Black Study, Stefan O'Harney and Fred Moten analyze the university as a domain of professionalization. In service of professionalization, the critical academic questions the university and the state while simultaneously recognizing and reinstitutionalizing those institutions. Below the business of mastery, critique, and distance, however, lies the undercommons. The undercommons is the refuge for those defined as, quote, too mystical, too full of belief, end quote. The communist and the witch meet each other here, both two, too two minutes, mystical, please. both too full of belief. This is the domain that anthropologists warned about in their admonitions against, quote, going native. It is, quote, unprofessional behavior at its most obvious, end quote. To challenge the assumption of the university as a site of mastery, critique, and distance is to admit that study can produce something other than workers. And finally, not a conclusion. One, post-socialism is not a euphemism for Eastern Europe. Two, the struggle to cultivate historical consciousness cannot be reduced to nostalgia. Three, the anti-communist prejudice that overwhelmingly undergirds post-socialist discourse should be labeled and confronted openly. 
for the tendentious connections between communism, abolition, decolonization, and the unprofessional underclass of the university or the undercommons drive insurgent post-socialist methodologies. Five, the project of insurgent post-socialist methodology is the practice of speaking with two tongues, one institutional, one vernacular. Six, every struggle is linked, but these struggles are laden with incommensurabilities. As Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang state, opportunities for solidarity lie in what is incommensurable rather than what is in common. Seven, in a recent interview with Joy James on the popularization of the prison abolition movement, Felicia Denod asks James whether they should concede the ground of abolition to those who practice academic abolitionism or celebrity abolitionism, or whether they should denounce those impotent abolitionisms as, quote, not abolitionism. James responds saying that for herself, I'm not going to argue with you about words. So we also will not argue about words about whether a post-socialism is true or false. This debate is a waste of time and we find these distinctions to be self-evident. Eight, post-socialist methodology is a Trojan horse. What appears as distance is actually too earnest. This earnestness is dangerous and insurgent pedagogy inside the university and the museum. And finally, number nine, the world that reveals itself in the unsettling of post-socialism is a world with a revolutionary past, present, and future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to both speakers for sticking to 20 minutes. So that gives us, I calculate, about 15 minutes, because we started five minutes late. Uh, <laughs> so um, notwithstanding Dimitris's comments about quantification, um, we have 15 minutes. Um, to talk about some of these issues. Uh, I've got some comments and questions, but I'd like to open this up to the floor first. Um, thank you uh, to, the, to the speakers. <laughs> I have a question for Dimitris. Um, Basically, what, what I gathered from your talk is that you're proposing um, uh, abduction as opposed to neoliberal cooptation um, of forms of thought, uh, ideas, and neoliberal appropriation. Um, I'm wondering whether, um, I mean, my question is, I mean, you're offering an imminent critique, and my question is not very imminent to <laughs> the discourses of neoliberalism. I'm wondering if um, neoliberalism, neoliberalism itself does not uh, precisely um, conceive, right, of the intellectual sphere, of the cultural sphere, um, as 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 uh, having primacy over the economic sphere, while at the same time it economizes uh, those relations, cultural, intellectual, and so on. So, if we are divorcing, let's say, in infrastructural critique and analysis of neoliberalism from the modes of thought that is it producing aren't we ending up again reproducing the neoliberal uh, logic? I mean, if we're talking about, let's say, cooptation of uh, forms of thought and reappropriation uh, of um, affect or forms of thought that neoliberalism cannot basically uh, uh, um, co-opt, re-co-opt, re aren't, um, aren't we divorcing this uh, proposition, political proposition, from an um, infrastructural critique of neoliberalism, or maybe that's not your intention. Thanks. Um, thank you for your question. I think, I think abduction is, when I said a mode of thinking, I just try to simplify what I mean. It's a, it's a mode of inquiry, I think, that is not, that is not as easily reproduced. If we think of neoliberalism as a political epistemology, amongst the other things that I think are already well covered, you know, by Marxist or history of idea approaches. But if, I think this is a thing that's not well covered. So if this is like a form of critique we want to perform, we need to be doing it in a way that doesn't reproduce many of the epistemological tenets. And I think abduction could be such a mode of inference, precisely because it allows us to question things that otherwise would perhaps remain hidden. This is not to say that other forms sort of critique um, 
are not equally valid and important. It's just this one aspect that I think sometimes we forget. Also, I'm not sure about the intellectual sphere because I think neoliberalism is an explicitly anti-intellectual movement, right? I mean, it builds on expertise, but it's technocratic ways of knowledge making rather than intellect. So I'm not sure if I got this question right. But we can talk about this later, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, we've got two. So there's one here. Yeah. Uh, I have one question for Christina. Maybe it was already in your presentation. I didn't understand. I don't know. Maybe it's a clarification or maybe it wasn't there. But I would be interested in understanding which is your concept of socialism, in which sense it is or not separated of the, if you want, I don't know, experience no, of uh, Soviet socialism and others. And in your definition, what do we have to learn no, from your socialism for the new emancipatory proposals? Because this has been totally clear for me. Christina? Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, in my working definition, I'm using the lived experience of self-defined socialist states, but also socialist movements, activist movements, um, historically rather than trying to parse apart what exactly is, a, again, a real socialism versus a false flag operation. Um, sorry, with the second part of your question, could you repeat it? What, what can we learn today from socialism in order to build new, new emancipatory proposals? Yeah, I think that the biggest contribution that socialist experience has is the trans, like, translation of theory and small activist projects into an actual infrastructure and not so easily consigning off um, states and institutions as inherently dangerous and therefore to be avoided um, because in the present moment with so many small bits scattered all over the place and a general suspicion so of institutions and states, it makes it very difficult to have any sort of momentum or real like people's power generated. Thank you. So question over here, please. Thank you. Yeah, this works. Um, uh, Jauke Heiser from Free University Brussels. I have a question for uh, Dimitri. Um, uh, in, in your presentation, you, you suggest you, you look a bit into the so-called limits of neoliberalism and then you criticize it very much from a, a position where you say, well, it cannot be or an anti-positivist, it cannot be uh, quantifiable, etc. And we need to find a spaces of contestation for new neoliberalism in those spheres uh, that do not fall in that category. Now, isn't there a risk then that you equate neoliberalism too much with positivism or with the type of reasoning which is very present in neoliberalism? I agree on that. Uh, and isn't it the case that, that, it, that you alienate maybe some uh, forces, ideas, lines of thought from from a counter neoliberal uh, project or uh, alter neoliberal project. Well, maybe it's not alter uh, by by sort of uh, going too much on. Well, we need to get rid of or, or focusing too much on the hegemony of 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 quantif everything need to be quantified. Uh, to give an example, if you think of the environmentalist movement, well, you have very neoliberal parts of it and you have very radical parts of it. But if you look at the IPCC reports, those are very positivist, very much quantified. And I do th still think that there is much value in them and in the projections they make, et cetera, and that they can also serve as a basis counter uh, uh, neoliberalism uh, in some way or another. So I was wondering a bit how you reflect on upon that. Just before you answer that, can I add something else to that, which is about this broader question of hegemony, which we, we haven't really talked about so far. I'm still looking for a convincing account of what the agency is for neoliberalism here. You know, you talk about doxa, uh, common sense, as if 
people have somehow internalized it. They might not agree with it, but they can't do anything else. I don't think this is true. I, th I think, I hope as well, that there, in fact, if people could be have the question put to them about whether or not they supported what we claim are the tenets of neoliberalism, most people in the world would be against it. That's why I think there is a global opposition to this that hasn't been mobilized, but could be. But what 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 are the agents or the agencies of neoliberalism now? Um, and within that, this is sorry, another quick one. Um, how is the dissipation of American power in the world going to affect this hegemonic process? Because it, it looks as if, obviously it's a, it's, a, it's a tendentious issue, but it looks as if US power in the world is retreating a little bit from the idea that it can represent convincingly the idea of freedom that it hegemonically claimed to stand for and coercively managed to impose back in the mid, mid and late 20th century. All right, thanks for both questions. I'd like to maybe answer this. So it's not a, maybe this wasn't clear, it's not a critique of positivism per se. It's that a critique of neoliberalism can never be quantitative in nature. So this is not to say that forms of positivist knowledge may be important. It's just to say that when we are performing critiques, you know, we are running risk of reproducing the very tenants. We can do this, but the goal is to sort of minimize this reproduction or at the very least be sort of aware of it. I would raise, but this is on another note, whether or not this is really, whether we can really compartmentalize sort of the environment to sustainable goals that we can then, you know, sort of counter. But this is another sort of issue, but I think this is part and parcel with the process. If this sort of answers your question. But I understand it. It's not... I'm not a big fan of positivism as it is. I mean, I'm not going to lie, but, you know, <laughs> but I do think, you know, a positivist critique, like I read an article recently about quantifying neoliberalism. Like how far can we go when we do this? And to your question, is this a Grumpian take? <laughs> okay. now, I'm just curious because um, this is something I'm struggling with myself. I mean... I cannot tell you anything about U.S. power. I wouldn't feel like I don't think I know sort of enough. But I do think I don't know if we were if we were to think neoliberalism is merely that, like ideology or f free market policy. Then I'm not sure that um, you know people would be completely against it because this sort of thing I think it is inbuilt the ways in which we think or compartmentalize the world to think of pros and cons. I do think this is sort of a, a very subtle mode of co compartmentalizing, you know, costs and benefits in a sense. I'm not saying that the, 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 the genealogy of neoliberalism will lead us to that this is a neoliberal thought, but it works really well. And I think to think through other modes of, you know, organizing and so on and forth is important. And I think this is something we don't reflect upon because it has become commonsensical. I'm not saying that, you know, I think really... Yeah, it's a combination of things, but I think this this is an understudied, if you will, aspect. And again, this is like a, if we were to perform neoliberal, like critique on neoliberalism, this is just a suggestion for a way forward. Thanks. We've got about three minutes. I'm sure we'll carry on talking about these questions and issues later on. Any more comments or questions from the floor? Paola? It's just for Dimitri and the, the neoliberalism being inbuilt is not exactly the same, but I was thinking about Foucault and how he says that the fascism is inbuilt and we have an authoritarian um, mind that is uh, pre-established and we have to fight against it. You know, the two, I don't know, but it's, you are talking in a, in a similar sense. Do you, do you know the text of Foucault where he actually he says that the, 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 the fascination about fascism is not just on the structure, it's, this, it's part of our uh, main core, you know? I wonder if neoliberalism can think it in a sim similar way. I don't, I don't know the text I draw from Foucault, but I really think as socialized subjects, I agree with you. I mean, we're socialized. I think there's a sort of yeah, conservative and neoliberal t tilt in our sort of personhood. Which is why I think you know we're more sort of prone to internalize 
such ideas. So I would like to know about this text. I'll ask you later. managing I, with the example with pros and cons or how to organize uh, emancipatory practice that actually builds on risk and, and management of, mm. on time finally it's very difficult to get out of that because we are built into this so yeah um, yeah right and i mean the suggestion is really again to like be aware of how we are reproducing it and mm. whether there's other modes mm. that sort of perhaps could minimize mm. reproduction not that we will overcome it by, like in, in this sense. Thank you. Okay, we've opened up some very interesting broader areas of discussion. We have to finish now because it's time for lunch, but we regroup at 3 p.m. Where is the lunch? Now, physically, where is the lunch? Is it? It's upstairs. Where is my lunch? Okay, thank you very much. And thanks to both our speakers. Thank you very much.